Praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. No matter what kind of week you've had, we can rejoice and be glad in God's designs because they're good for you. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we believe we receive all the help that you have for us right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we take it all. We need the Holy Spirit to breathe on the word that you've given us, that we might receive revelation, and Father, that it might activate in our lives, in the soil of our hearts, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Oh, this is going to be so good. We're already off to a great start for breaking enemy lines. And here we go into episode part two, five steps to your breakthrough, five steps to breakthrough for your life, for your family, for your home. From the very start, I told you this series is about spiritual warfare, but more importantly, it's about the borders of God's blessing for your life. We looked at Psalm 16, verse five through six. Let's look at it again. The Lord is my chosen and assigned portion, my cup. You hold and maintain my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good heritage. Say that out loud. I have a good heritage. Yes, you have an inheritance from God Almighty already surveyed, marked out, and maintained. So where does the spiritual warfare part come in? I'm glad you asked. Jesus said Satan is the father of all lies and all that is false. This enemy is a defeated foe. You can be sure of that. Compliments of Jesus, victory at the cross. But as we learned in part one, we, we have to continually exercise our privilege of keeping his spiritual bacteria out of our lives, our thinking, out of our spiritual territory. That's right. Breaking enemy lines is when the offense penetrates the opponent's defensive lines. That breakthrough is, in fact, breaking the enemy's line. Sounds kind of footballish, doesn't it, right? I once saw a locker room poster and it went something like this. The devil whispered in my ear, you're not strong enough to withstand the storm today. I whispered in the devil's ear, I am the storm. Oh, I like that. When you're a child of God, clothed with his light, his armor, knowing your authority and power in Christ Jesus, my friend, you are the devil's worst nightmare. And it doesn't matter if you're six or 96 years old, rich or poor, tall or short, male or female, you are mighty in Christ Jesus. Now that said, there are other enemies like ignorance, and our own soul if we embrace self-deception. Some people stay bound because they only see the enemy outside, never the traitor in the mirror. Judas trusted enemy lines and Judas killed Judas. He didn't recognize the traitor in the mirror. In part one, we learned about lines, portions, intel, and evil reports. Right? We even talked a little bit about FPR. If you want to know what that is, look at part one. The enemy is a ground stealer and a light faker. Jesus defeated him and banished him to the underworld. So now he works illegally to gain access into human life through his forgeries and his deceptions. That's why we fight this good fight. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to his protege. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of the faith in the conflict with evil. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you were made the good confession of faith in the presence of many witnesses. Don't miss the operative term here. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't waste time with battles that God hasn't assigned you to. A fight that is neither good nor of faith is not for you. And let me say it again, this series is not to glorify or give press any PR to the enemy. No, a thousand times no. Above all, this series is meant to draw attention to the pleasant lines and boundaries of inheritance that God has already given us, and then to help us understand the warning in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. 
We can't tolerate ignorance of the enemy's tactics when our privilege in Christ Jesus is to easily be breaking enemy lines. He was defeated at the cross by Jesus, the King of Kings, and as the army of God, we get to discharge and uphold the lines of victory here on earth. Yes, we're the Knights of Jesus Kingdom Roundtable breaking enemy lines. <laughs> Life moves from the invisible to the visible, from the spiritual to the physical, because all of life moves toward manifestation, from root to fruit. Are you getting this? Victor Hugo, the famous French writer, he once said, if you don't build castles in the air, you won't build anything on the ground. Think of it. The most amazing architecture on earth consists of lines born in the imagination of mankind. Now, as a spirit living in this natural realm, you have an enemy. Yes, he's defeated, but it's up to each one of us to know his schemes and uphold the victory in our lives, the victory of Christ. So let's go on the offensive. As I said in part one, Jesus gives us authority to break enemy lines. So here are five steps. Remember, I promised you five steps to breaking enemy lines. Here we go. Number one, this is simple, get counsel. Number one, get counsel. Do you want to win the fight? get the prize, come out victorious, get counsel, qualified, wise, godly counsel. You're struggling with fear, addiction, unbelief and hopelessness, a poor self-esteem, terrible memories from the past. Oh, those are awful. Get wise, godly, Bible-based counsel. God's word is the ultimate resource for counsel to make war against all spiritual enemies. Look at Proverbs 24, verse six. For by wise counsel, you can wage your war and in an abundance of counselors, there is victory, there's safety. To any super spiritual folks out there who are all about spiritual warfare, never forget, that God's word advises us to get wisdom above all things. Yes, you have power in Christ Jesus, but if you're not using his wisdom in tandem with his power, you're in error. You'll end up doing stupid things that misrepresent the name of Christ, and it's happened. And you'll do more damage than good. There is never a time that we do not need counsel. Four-star Admiral William H. McRaven, he's a Navy SEAL and a best-selling author, he said this, the elite commando motto, who dares wins, had to be backed up by who plans and prepares wins. Most everyone can tell the story of David and Goliath, right? Famous. It's the ultimate story of who dares wins. But we often overlook the years of lonely preparation that little David endured as a shepherd boy in the wilderness. The hero David on the battlefield was built by God guarding little lambs from wolves, lions, and bears. He was such a ridiculous expert with a slingshot by the time he faced Goliath that it really was just a question of which eyebrow little David found more offensive on Goliath, <laughs> right? Spiritually speaking, you don't look for risk. That's just foolish. God's not pleased with sacrifice, but he does want your obedience. God gives us spiritual armor to put on. It's obedient to be prepared, to be armed, to be submitted. And if God tells you to take refuge, then you need to take refuge. Risk is not a strategy, nor does it prove bravery. Being courageous is not a substitute for being prepared. Can I say that again? Being courageous is not a substitute for being prepared. Just ask Zorro, part one. A friend of mine told me a story of a guy who got married with no counsel. This nice guy prayed, he felt good, figured God approved, so he just jumped in. Well, he and the young lady jumped in and only a few weeks later, divorce was on the table and both people were very hurt and now they're very confused. My friend, get counsel, get counsel, then get prepared and then get more counsel because breaking enemy lines requires counsel. Now, number two, number two of our five parts here, our five steps. Number two step, receive power and authority, receive it. 
God's grace is useless if you won't receive it. If you don't believe it, then you don't receive it. Jesus said in John 1, 12, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, that's Jesus, God gave the authority, power, privilege, and right to become the children of God. So that is so that we who believe in it, hear to trust in and rely on his name. We can walk in that power. That's absolutely amazing, but it starts off with the words receive and welcome. No mention of the word presume and assume. It's receive and welcome. The outcome of truly receiving by believing, which is trusting and relying on Jesus' identity, that outcome of that kind of receiving gets his authority, his power, his privileges, his rights. Now that's the kind of unstoppable force that the devil's demonic forces are terrified of. They have no defense against that kind of power. Look at Luke 9, verse 1. Then Jesus called together the 12 apostles and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Power and authority over all devils. Did you see that? And it comes after Jesus called and then gave. I don't know why receiving is such a challenging thing for us, but it really seems to be. I know some Christians that want to receive eternal life from Jesus. They want forgiveness for their sins. But then when it comes to the other blessings, oh no, I, I don't want to assume too much. I'll, I'll leave all that stuff about fighting devils to other folks. You know, that's not the way it works, my friend. The devil actually looks for people who refuse God's free gifts. He looks for people who only half believe God, but limp between other ideologies. If you trust in God, then it's time to truly put all, all of your trust in God. Anything else is allowing, permitting enemy lines. Stephen Covey, the author of The Speed of Trust, said this, There are two components to trust, character and competence. See, you can't trust someone that you don't know. Knowing God's character will grow your belief in him. Don't confuse God's competence with your own competence. His name can work miraculously for anyone, but it doesn't mean that you're known by him or even competent. His name is just that powerful. You can't substitute the powerful outcomes of using his name to exempt yourself from trusting in his name. You getting this? His results are not your virtue. Don't get confused by the applause or the criticism. Using Jesus' name doesn't give you a character makeover. That requires you trusting in, relying on, activating, and living in Christ Jesus. In the book of Acts 19, seven sons of the Jewish priest Sceva were doing exorcisms on different people until they came upon one evil spirit who said this, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Their identity wasn't spiritually settled in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. That made them vulnerable. Sitting ducks, soul compromised. So guess what happened? The man possessed by the evil spirit jumped on them, mastered them, hurt them, and wounded them. Look, breaking enemy lines is for those who believe on Jesus Christ and receive their identity in his name. Don't mess around or you could lose your shirt like the seven sons of Sceva did. Now, number three of our five steps here is take your stand. As the saying goes, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. The problem is too many people are taking a stand without a standard. God gives us the absolute standard of morality. Anything less is building on the sand, or in this case, standing in quicksand. Taking a stand of faith is not only lifting your protective shield against the enemy, it's also raising the sword of the Spirit. Taking your stand is speaking God's word, and it has profound defensive and offensive affect. It's action both ways, but standing on the truth is too often not activated. Neglecting to speak God's word is simply the outcome of not believing God's word. Trust me, you'd take your stand if you believed the standard worked. We touched on this in part one, but this time let me read beyond resisting and taking our stand. Ephesians 6, verses 13 to 17. 
Therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger and having done all to stand firmly in your place. Stand therefore, hold your ground. Say that with me, hold your ground. Having tightened the belt of truth around your loins and having put on the breastplate of integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing with God. Verse 15, and having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, lift up over all the shield of faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the the spirit wields, which is the word of God. Oh, God perfectly arms us to overcome. And this is for you and your family to stand your ground, hold your ground. Admiral William H. McRaven, again, he said, the mistakes of action are far less consequential than the mistakes of inaction. He qualified that by saying, you mitigate the risk through extensive planning and preparation. You have to take your stand. That means enforce, act on the plan, engage accordingly. A friend of mine and a board member of this ministry recently made the prayerful decision to go on his son's school board. They had many immoral voices wanting to decide what kind of ideas and parasites should go into his kid's mind. Yeah, think about that. Time to take a stand, folks, or die in the wilderness with an enemy occupying your territory. Take back your ground and hold it. Take back your kids, your kids' minds and thinking and wash them with God's word and truth. You'll see joy come back into their hearts and lives. How do you use God's armor? His weapons of truth, it's all voice activated with your faith. You say out loud, Lord, I put on the spiritual armor you've given me. I put on your truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. Lord, I'm going to stand my ground and not back down. It doesn't always have to rhyme, but you can do it like that. Oh, Stephen, do I, do I have to pray like that? Seems kind of spiritualistic to me. Hey, I've seen some of you talk to your devices to get information or do a search, right? I've seen you talk to your car to activate drive directions and find your satellite station, right? I've even seen you talk to yourself on the golf course when you slice into the pond or the sand trap, but oh no, you don't want to activate God's power over the enemy because that's just a little bit weird for you. It's time to wake up, my friend. This isn't a game. It's life and the players play for keeps. Check this out, Romans 13, starting at verse 11. Beside this, you know what a critical hour this is, how it is high time now for you to wake up out of your sleep, rouse to reality. Verse 12, the night is far gone and the day is almost here. Let us then drop, fling away the works and deeds of darkness and put on the full armor of light. God says, wake up to reality, people, wake up. So now number four of our five steps. Number four, this is a good one. It's called breakthrough. Number four, breakthrough. God's an expert on breakthrough and breakthrough is for you. Say breakthroughs for me. It's for you. It's God's will for your life. In fact, Jesus and his anointing power is a breakthrough power in your life. Look at Micah 2 verse 13. The breaker, the Messiah, will go up before them. They will break through, pass in through the gate and go out through it, and their king will pass on before them, the Lord at their head. Breakthrough. Jesus, the Messiah, gives us breakthrough. God always overcomes evil. You can live in that reality, but it's a choice. To walk in breakthrough power is to weaponize the truth against the adversary, the devil. Jesus resisted the devil's temptation in the wilderness himself with just saying, it is written, and then he would speak the word of God. That's God's word. Jesus broke through the enemy's attempts to hijack his destiny, his character, his identity by declaring God's truth. When a lie comes to your mind, a temptation to give up or to go back, and instead you speak God's promise, that releases faith into the atmosphere for breakthrough. It forces devils into their defeated ranks. It activates angelic forces to marshal borders for you. 
Breakthrough is simply the release of faith mixed with obedience. You believe the word, you speak the word, and then you act on the word. You know, Pam and I, we have a friend, Tracy. And one day her husband just left her. She could have given up. She could have blamed God and believed the lies of the devil because believe me, there were a lot of lies the enemy was speaking into her mind. She could have believed it was all over. Happiness was forever gone and she and her girls would be alone. Statistics, casualties of the war on love and marriage. But no, she believed that God had a future for her, that God could turn the curse into a blessing. What an audacious faith in God. What breakthrough faith. Tracy believed God is the creator of new beginnings and a capable redeemer of all that was lost. God sent Tracy a great man, yes, a far better man in my opinion, and a husband for her and a great dad to her girls. We call that breaking enemy lines. Breakthrough, folks, it's real. I even had the privilege of performing their wedding ceremony for them, and yes, first they got counsel. Uh, you break the enemy lines by overcoming. How? Believing on God and talking like Jesus. It is written. That's what Jesus said. It is written. Understand this. Authority is released when you speak the truth. Not when you think the truth or think the word. That's important. And we all need to meditate on God's word, but it doesn't become a force to break enemy lines until it's released by faith into the atmosphere, into the ethos. Let me remind you, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they who indulge it will eat the fruit of it for life or death. And breaking enemy lines, step number five. Here we go. Repeat, repeat, and then repeat. You must endure, persevere, continue on, never give up and never quit. You will get knocked down, but don't ever give up. Don't stay down, get up, rise up, ask for help and keep going forward. Bill Murray, the, the comedian and actor, he once said this, whatever you do, always give 100% unless you're donating blood. <laughs> it's pretty, that's pretty good advice. Keep working steps one through five as you trust in the Lord every step of the way. Repeat, repeat, be tenacious. Are you tempted to give up? Don't fall for the devil's line. He had 1,000 years of experience being a deceiver, but God's truth is powerful and Jesus' victory is amazing. So don't give up because that's not you. You know whom you believe and it's not the liar in chief. Proverbs 24, verse 16. For a righteous man or a righteous woman falls seven times and rises again. Okay, so you fell. You know what to do. Get up and repeat steps one through five again. Don't waste time feeling sorry for yourself. Don't waste time analyzing the mess. Focus on Jesus, the light, his truth, his mercy. Black China, she's a famous model, reality star. Well, she gave her life to Jesus. And at a ceremony for her graduation at Sacramento Bible College, she said this, God has never given up on me. I wanna to continue to walk in his light and learn and grow and be an inspiration to my family, friends, and kids. This girl's serious. She's even getting her tattoos of demon symbols removed from her body. She got baptized because she wants all that God has for her, which includes breaking enemy lines. I tell her story to tell you that all of us have falls and failures in our life, but don't ever give up. Get up, but don't ever give up. God has great things in store for you, but it's on the other side of the breakthrough, so don't wait. Get breaking enemy lines today with God's help. Number five, repeat, repeat, and repeat again. You know what? We have weapons on demand that God has given us. Look, it's no secret we all need God's help to overcome, to break enemy lines. So God provides. The Bible calls them weapons of warfare, and they're not to mount over the fireplace, folks, or place on the wall somewhere. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verses four and five. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Yes, the battle over sin and death is already won. The devil's defeated by Jesus, praise God. So why do we need weapons? These weapons are to overthrow and destroy strongholds, enemy lines that need to be dismantled. After a war, the allied forces need to bring the land into a state of order and peace. That means we've got to get rid of the minefields, the traps, the booby traps, rebels, enemy snipers who will still occupy territories illegally they don't want to leave. Old enemy trenches and barricades, those lines have to be erased, filled in, dissolved, repaired, gone over forever. The land must be restored to the lawful order of the boundaries and the lines of authority for your life. And that's beautiful. Some of us want to do big things, like use our faith to affect situations in the natural world, pray for the sick to be healed, call in provision for the poor and move obstructions, you know, move mountains into the sea, so to speak. But here's the challenge. If you haven't used your faith weapons to lead your own thoughts and imaginations into the obedience of Christ, how in the world can you move what's outside your mind? That's cognitive disassociation. Your real belief is contradicting your outward profession. You're at war with yourself. James calls that being double-minded. You cannot ignore moving a mountain of doubt and fear from your thinking, but somehow move the mountain of corruption out of your town. The inner reality always moves to authenticate the outer manifestation. It's the turtle on the fence post again. Let's pray from our five steps to authorize God's power in a specific area. This is a model for you. Maybe the enemy's been tormenting you with fear about the future, your health, your family. Let's use our five steps to guide our prayer right now. Here we go. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we ask you for counsel. That's number one, counsel to deal with this fear. Your word tells us that perfect love casts down fear. Fill the dark places of our heart, illuminate the dark places of our heart with your love so fear has no place. Step number two, we receive power and authority from Jesus to cast out this devil of fear. In Jesus' name, we evict fear. Step three, we take our stand and we hold our ground. We lift up the shield of faith and it extinguishes all those fiery missiles of fear. Praise God, it's happening, right? It's happening. Step four, we're breaking through these enemy lines. It is written. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Yes, we're talking Jesus talk now. And step number five, we dedicate our hearts to repeat and repeat and repeat this process because we're never gonna give up in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.